great start. I'm Patrick Kinney. Um, I'm uh, one of the participants in the NASA Health and Applied Sciences um, Air Quality Team. Um, and today we're going to be talking about some work we've been doing over the past year uh, trying to assess health impacts of air pollution at the community scale. Um, I am going to uh, talk for about five minutes um, and if I can figure out how to advance my slides, which seemed to work yesterday, but um, no, there we go. Um, so what I'm talking about when, when, we, when we talk about high, high resolution uh, air pollution and health assessments, what we're trying to do is find ways to get information about air quality at, at scales that are relevant to urban decision makers. And this picture here um, illustrates um, on the left side a uh, picture of air quality uh, in the Los Angeles region. Uh, if we base that picture based on simply the um, air quality monitors that are available uh, in that region. On the right side, we see an example of an enhanced uh, estimate of PM 2.5 concentrations. Uh, so the same kind of data, but now taking into account um, satellite-based remote sensing along with land use variables to come up with a much finer scale picture of air quality. Now, why do we care about that? You know, why would health uh, practitioners care about those sorts of, that sort of re resolution? Well, for one thing, we're increasingly try to, trying to do health studies at fine spatial scales within cities. So uh, having uh, higher resolution exposure data will enhance epidemiologic studies. Also, we're doing health impact assessments. We want to understand the burden of air pollution related disease uh, at the fine scale, trying to understand where uh, hot spots are for pollution and where we might want to target um, uh, interventions to reduce those exposures. Um, having fine scale data can also help us track progress as we implement solutions at the, at the neighborhood scale. We can see over time how, how effective we are in, in those um, solutions. And then finally, uh, a lot of cities are taking action on climate mitigation, carbon mitigation, and um, understanding the health correlates, the health co-benefits of those uh, actions at the fine scale can be a, another useful bit of information that urban decision makers uh, can use. Um, the project we're talking about today um, had several objectives. Um, one, of the, the, one of them had to do with incorporating low cost sensor data into fine scale uh, impact assessments. A second one uh, was to really estimate uh, PM 2.5 concentrations at fine scales in a few selected cities and other locations uh, using uh, remote sensing data from satellites along with other kinds of data. We had a third aim that had to do with uh, wildfire modeling and uh, exposure estimation. And then finally, um, taking the outputs from those, uh, those various aims to, to uh, calculate uh, health impacts at fine spatial scales. Today we'll be focusing primarily on number two and number four with a little bit of number one mixed in. Um, today's agenda uh, as posted on the, on the announcement is, is as follows. Uh, this initial couple of minutes is me uh, giving it a project overview. We'll be I'll be followed by Yang Liu, who's a professor at Emory uh, Rollins School of Public Health. Um, we'll be talking about the, um, the use of satellite data to get fine scale estimates. Susan Annenberg will then show how she's used those data to estimate health impacts at fine scales. And then we'll see an interesting case study in an agricultural region in Southern California uh, with Frank Friedman and Akula Venkratan. Uh, um, we have a large team of participants uh, in the project, uh, which is listed here. I won't go through them all, but I just wanted you to, under to understand that um, it's, it's uh, that more than just the people that are presenting today uh, have contributed to this work. And finally, we have lots of uh, partners outside, uh, some of whom uh, are at state agencies, city agencies, uh, all other universities uh, who are listed here. So with that, I would like to now turn over the mic to um, Yang Liu uh, for, the, uh, for the next talk. Okay. Um... Let me share my screen. Hold on. Um, hold on. All right. 
I mean, I had to do it this way because it uh, screen shifts to another monitor. So I hope anybody, uh, everybody can can uh, can see my screen. Um, the talk is about estimating uh, neighborhood scale PM gradients in New York City by integrating uh, satellite data and non-regulatory measurements. Uh, as Pat just said, uh, the goal of the overall Tiger Team project is to evaluate how we can integrate uh, satellite, NASA satellite data, regulatory and non-regulatory ground measurements, uh, ancillary data sets such as weather and land use to estimate a uh, fine scale PM uh, 2.5 gradient and, how, and use them for a city scale health impact assessment and other um, sort of downstream applications. Uh, the, the motivation of, of this study is uh, first that the regulatory monitors are often too sparse to, to assess inter, uh, sorry, intra-city PM gradients, uh, especially at the neighborhood scales. Uh, we're talking about 100 meter to probably uh, 250 meter resolution. Uh, in the past decade, there have been a wave of satellite models developed to do uh, the space-time uh, characterization of PM. But these models usually have a one kilometer to a few or 10 kilometer resolution, uh, which is too coarse. Well, not, not, I would say, not fine enough to resolve a neighborhood level uh, PM concentration gradient. Uh, in the most uh, recent couple of years, we have seen uh, non regulatory and low cost sensors coming up that often produce very dense networks and also uh, noisy but high frequency data. The objectives of our study in New York City are to, to estimate daily PM concentrations by combining the three uh, data, uh, data sources and trying to evaluate the impact of fusing these three uh, sources of information. So what we have is a random forest model developed for the uh, New York City and a three kilometer buffer around it, roughly 800 square kilometers in size. Uh, the model, uh, simply put, on the left-hand side has the daily PM concentration measurements as the dependent variable. On the right-hand side, we have uh, multiple predictors, including the NASA MIAC AOD, Retrievals at one kilometer resolution, we have weather parameters, uh, land use, land cover indicators, we have traffic volume data from the New York uh, City, and then road length information, and then point emission sources from EPA, and then population density and other um, predictors. And we fitted uh, two very similar models. One, as we call it, uh, EPA model, includes only EPA measurements. We have about 20 monitors in our domain. The second model combines the EPA measurements with the uh, New York City's own NICAS uh, monitor measurements. NICAS in our, in our uh, study period of 2015 has over 60, uh, 60 monitoring locations. In this table, you can see the sample size change after we include NICAS data. Uh, it added uh, over 40% data to the, uh, to the overall uh, model fitting data set. The, second, uh, the third role in the table is the cross-validation R-square values. Here you, you see the difference between the purely EPA model and the EPA plus NICAS model. Simply put, adding uh, NICAS data into the model actually deteriorates the model performance a bit, as indicated by the lower R-square values. Um, the regression slopes are comparable. They're close to uh, one. Now, these two figures show the predicted PM concentration surface in our modeling domain. Uh, the left one is the EPA-only model. The right one is the EPA plus NICAS model. You can, you can tell the differences between the two. On the right-hand side, uh, the model, the, the, the random forest model is predicting higher concentrations around, uh, along major roads and then more densely populated uh, uh, 
uh, on the lower right corner, that is the, uh, the Kennedy Airport. So if we zoom in, you see a lot of details on this 100 meter resolution prediction surface. Okay, I, I, there are three blowout maps to demonstrate the Central Park, the uh, New York State Highway 27, and then around the JFK Airport. This figure shows the, uh, the difference, the relative difference between the EPA model predictions and then the, the EPA plus NICAS model predictions. The take home message is that the EPA plus NICAS model are over 15% higher along major roads and in more densely populated neighborhoods. So the implication here is that uh, if the city is to estimate the uh, health burden due to PM exposure using the EPA alone uh, data or EPA alone model, uh, the overall city, uh, city health burden may have been underestimated because the uh, adding NICAS data would actually change the spatial distribution and put more weight on the populated uh, areas. Now, we also evaluated the, uh, the benefit of having the satellite data. Uh, keep in mind, the satellite data has a one kilometer resolution, right? So we redistribute uh, the uh, satellite retrievals and other, inf other pieces of information using land use parameter to reach that 100 meter resolution. Uh, the left figure shows the mean difference between the two models. And, and uh, despite the color, the actual mean difference is almost negligible. For the EPA plus NICAS model, have uh, uh, with or without AOD, the mean estimates are almost the same. On the right-hand side, you will see the contribution or the benefit of having the NASA satellite data, which is uh, for about 15 to 20 days per year, you see large differences uh, that should be probably 15, 20% difference in parts of the city, the, the highlighted yellow and red region. Um, in this area, if we have the, the NASA AOD, the predictions are much higher than a model without AOD. So the overall conclusion is this. Uh, we have to keep in mind that the satellite-based model are trained by ground monitoring data. So the number and spatial allocation uh, of these monitors have a strong influence on the final results. And uh, we cannot just use R-square as the only indicator for model performance. As you can see from the previous slides, the spatial distributions are very different even though the EPA plus NICAS model has a lower R-square, the, the, uh, the spatial pattern of PM looks more reasonable. And the second take-home message is that the, the non-regulatory measurements, well, I'm not calling it low-cost sensors because uh, the NICAS monitors are actually high-quality uh, high quality harbor impact monitors, right? Uh, the overall network lowers its operational cost by uh, taking only uh, bi-weekly samples. So the non-regulatory measurements and AOD, they, they can be combined or fused to estimate very high resolution PM. And that would benefit future health impact assessments because without the NICAS data or without the, 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 the NASA satellite data, uh, we may have underestimated the uh, disease burden at the, at the neighborhood scale. So that is all I have. Thanks very much, Young. Um, and let me encourage um, participants to, using the chat box um, and uh, the little icon, the chat icon at the bottom of your, of your Zoom screen, if you have questions that you want to pose to any of the speakers, um, uh, you can uh, address those um, those chat comments, and we'll we'll address it. we'll we'll answer your questions uh, at the time at the end of our prepared comments. I'm going to now turn um, the podium over to Susan Annenberg, who will be talking about uh, how how one can take um, relatively fine scale estimates of 
PM 2.5 and estimate health impacts in cities. Okay, thank you so much, Pat. Are you all sharing my slides on your end? Yeah, yeah I think uh, Maria will do that if you'd like her to. Okay, yeah, that would be great. Well, um, well, that's coming up. Hello, everyone. My name is Susan Annenberg. I'm an associate professor in the School of Public Health at uh, George Washington University. Um, and that was a really nice uh, segue that uh, Young Lu gave because uh, what I'll be talking about now is applying these fine scale uh, PM 2.5 concentration estimates to do health impact assessment in four U.S. cities. So what I want to talk about first is just the overall uh, framework of risk assessment, um, just to give us a little bit of background. So there's a few steps in the risk assessment framework. First is hazard identification. Actually, if you just do one more click, some additional text will come up. Thank you. Um, so hazard identification means which pollutants cause which uh, health outcomes. Um, so in this case, there's already been a lot of hazard identification in the literature linking PM 2.5 with a range of, of health outcomes. Um, ex exposure assessment is um, what we uh, were just talking about, so how we use air quality monitors, models, and satellites, and we pull this information together to estimate exposure at, uh, for different geographical scopes and different spatial scales. Exposure response analysis is the third step, and those are typically health studies that characterize the, the uh, concentration or exposure or dose response relationship. And we typically draw those from epidemiological studies for health impact assessment. And then you put those three steps together, and um, that allows you to do risk characterization. Um, in this case, uh, what I'll be talking about is the number of cases, uh, like of deaths or asthma attacks or some other health outcome associated with. Uh, PM 2.5 ex exposure, um, either as in terms of the total burden uh, from the total concentrations of that uh, pollutant in the atmosphere or some change in that pollutant. So next slide. Just looking at this for, uh, in formula form, um, this is the equation that we use, the health impact function, to implement this risk assessment framework. So I just briefly want to describe uh, how we do this. The, the health impact function has two parts to it. The right side is the, the baseline number of cases of disease in the population. Um, so in this case, we're looking at four US populations. We're looking at the, the baseline numbers of uh, cases of, of disease. Um, and then the, the uh, first parenthetical here is the attributable fraction. That means the fraction of those cases that can be attributable to um, total PM 2.5 concentrations in the atmosphere. The beta here is the epidemiologically derived concentration response factor that comes directly from the epidemiology studies. And then delta X is the concentration. Those are the PM 2.5 concentration estimates that, um, that we've just been talking about. And when we, when we uh, put all these data sources together, we can estimate the annual cases of health outcomes that are attributable to PM 2.5. The next slide. Typically, when we do health impact assessment of uh, PM 2.5 uh, in the U.S., um, we're doing this um, at the at the U.S. scale, um, sometimes at the city scale. Um, I was just speaking from my experience at the U.S. EPA doing cost-benefit analysis for air regulations. Um, when the EPA is implementing uh, health impact assessments, um, typically we're running those at a gridded resolution and then summing results to, to a county scale. Um, and so here's a recent, uh, relatively recent, now it's, I guess getting a little aged, uh, paper that estimated the total burden of PM 2.5 in the United States. And you can see the range of health outcomes that were estimated. So turning now to what we uh, wanted to do with um, this particular study on the next slide, is to go beyond the county scale and start looking within individual cities. How, do, how does the burden of PM 2.5 um, on various health outcomes change by city, or sorry, by neighborhood within individual cities? So we know, as we just saw, that PM 2.5 varies quite a bit within individual cities. The disease rates also vary quite a bit. So what you can see here on the left is a map of baseline um, asthma prevalence in uh, New York City. And you can see that there's quite a bit of spatial heterogeneity in terms of the baseline uh, prevalence rate of asthma within an individual city. So how do we account for both fine scale PM 2.5 gradients and baseline disease rates? Um, 
that was sort of the, the objective of this portion of the Tiger team was to implement the health impact assessment at the census tract level, um, accounting for those, uh, that spatial variation in both disease rates and PM2.5. And what you see on the right is, the re is a result of that. So you see for four US cities, Boston, New York City, Los Angeles, and Washington, DC, and four health outcomes right at the top as an emergency department visit, COPD, lung cancer, and, and stroke. Um, these are uh, Z scores showing the ah. number of stand standard deviations from the mean in terms of um, asthma emer emergency department visits or these cases of these other health, health outcomes that are attributable to PM2.5. And you can see that there's quite a bit of spatial heterogeneity. Um, just looking at uh, Washington, D.C. at the bottom where I live, we have um, very high rates of PM2.5 attributable asthma emergency department visits in southeast. DC, um, which is as we would expect given the uh, spatial heterogeneity of asthma there. Um, and in fact, the, the picture changes depending on which health outcome we're looking at. Next slide. So you can, uh, we wanted to take a look at the difference between intra-city variability and inter-city variability for each of these health outcomes in each uh, city. Um, so what you see here is scatter plots of tract level attributable uh, rates of disease for stroke at the top left, asthma emergency permanent visits at the top right, COPD at the bottom left, and lung cancer at the bottom right. And what this shows is that intra-city variability often exceeds inter-city variability. So there's quite a bit of heterogeneity happening within cities, in fact, more so than we see between, uh, the, city, between the city averages. Next slide. Now, everything that I've shown up to this point has been using a global data set, a satellite derived data set of uh, PM 2.5 estimates that has been previously uh, published before this Tiger team began. Um, and so now that we have the uh, results for New York City in terms of PM 2.5 concentrations that Young Lu just uh, presented, we were able to implement those in the neighborhood scale health impact assessment and compare the results using the two different concentration data sets. So what you see here is New York City uh, results for attributable uh, cases of disease, uh, disease cases that are attributable to PM 2.5 um, using the, the new NASA HACAST data set that Young Lu just talked about on the left and the existing global scale data set published by Van Donkelaar um, on the right of each panel. And you can see that uh, using the new NASA HACAST data set, we're estimating lower PM2.5 concentrations and lower attributable uh, rates of disease um, with less spatial heterogeneity as well. Next slide. Um, and then you can compare the uh, hotspots of PM2.5 attributable asthma emergency department visits using the two different concentration uh, estimates. So on the left is using the existing global PM2.5 data set, and on the right is using the new uh, HACAST PM2.5 data set. And what this shows is that, you know, using different concentration estimates gives us different spatial distributions of, of health impacts. And so this is why it is very important to, um, uh, you know, investigate the, the PM2.5 health impacts and try to get it uh, to a point where, um, uh, we have the highest uh, confidence in the concentration estimates. Uh, next slide. Just to close with the uh, concluding um, statements that uh, we estimated the health impact attributable to PM2.5 at the census tract scale in four U.S. cities. We found that intra-city variability in PM2.5 health impacts often exceeded inter-city variability. And so there's quite a bit of spatial heterogeneity between neighborhoods within individual cities. And that different concentration estimates give different magnitudes and spatial patterns of PM2.5 health impact. And then finally, we hope that this type of analysis can inform city efforts to target air pollution mitigation actions. Um, particularly exciting, I think, is the ability to try to reduce health inequities, uh, because now we can understand hot spots of exposure and um, also account for uh, uh, spatial heterogeneity and baseline disease rates as well. Thank you. Thanks very much, Susan. Um, and um, 
Thank you to all who are uh, submitting some chat questions and comments. Um, I note one uh, new comment which uh, pointed out that um, there was an incorrect link on one of the early flyers. It's true, we updated our, our link to a Zoom link versus a Skype link, um, so I apologize for that, but I'm glad that uh, so many of you were able to join. Um, let's now move uh, to Frank Friedman and Akula Venkratam. Uh, they'll be talking about the case study in the Imperial Valley in California. And um, I think uh, Frank and, or Venki, you can go ahead and um, uh, share your screen. And Susan, if you have not already, please uh, stop sharing your screen. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending the webinar today. And hopefully everyone can hear me OK. Pat, can you hear me, everyone? Yes, you're, Thanks, you're coming Frank. through clearly. OK, so I'll share my screen right now and bring up the presentation and go to, so did the, let me get this out of the way. Sorry, can everyone see the presentation fine? Yes. Okay. Um, minimize that. Okay, thank you everyone. Well, um, the title of the talk is Fine Scale Particulate Matter Analysis in the California Imperial Valley Using Satellite AOD and Low Cost Sensors. This is actually a combination of three um, smaller studies led by um, various HACAS participants. Um, I'm Frank Friedman from San Jose State University. I'll be presenting part of the work. Um, Akula Venkatram will be presenting a second part, and Yang Lu, actually, who wasn't on the announcement. Um, he'll pre uh, present a third part too. So we'll get to all three of those. I want to thank our stakeholders who um, were involved in this work. Um, Paul English at the California Department of Health and, Health and Luis Olmedo at the Comité Civico del Valle and acknowledge various people who helped out on various technical matters. There. So a little background on the Imperial Valley. Um, everyone sees a map here on the upper right um, the, Imperial, the Imperial County is in the low southeast portion of California bordering the Mexican, uh, U.S. Mexico border. The Imperial Valley is part of Imperial County. It's an agricultural valley um, um, embedded within a desert environment with Salton Sea, which is an inland salt body lake to the north, a um, seabed. And then you see the U.S. mortar bounding the area to the south. So the Imperial Valley is very high air pollution particulate. It is a non-attainment area for both PM 2.5 and PM 10. It has among the highest asthma rates in the country. It is also a socioeconomically disadvantaged community, lots of migrant farm workers, and, um, and there's a lot of environmental justice issues down there that have driven a lot of the work that's been going on recently in the valley for air pollution. The sources of air pollution are several. It's an agricultural valley, so there's a lot of agricultural sources. A lot of vehicle and truck traffic associated with the agriculture. A lot of windblown dust, and I'll talk, uh, my part of the project, we'll talk about that. A lot of cross-boundary transport from Mexico, especially in the southern part of the valley. That's responsible for the PM 2.5 um, um, non-attainment status. And um, meteorologically, it's often very unfavorable. Winter inversions and high wind events at different times of year. Recently, as a result of these air pollution problems, there has been a low-cost sensor network that's come online since 2016 called IVAN, called the Imperial Valley Air Network. We will be using data from that network in the studies that you'll see here. Various web links to the IVAN network are here to learn more. So there, there are two air monitoring networks. Um, the routine monitoring network run by EPA and state mon uh, monitoring um, agencies, state agencies are on the left here. I've listed about five of them. There are other sites um, bordering the Salton Sea that aren't shown, but um, filling out that with the low cost sensors um, as shown here on the right, you can see there's, this is um, 40 Dylos PM sensors scattered around the valley that have come online since 2016. So we'll see the um, advantages um, and differences in results using IVAN versus non-IVAN in some of the talks here. And um, we'll move forward here. So. The monitoring, air, the routine air monitoring includes both PM10 and PM2.5. So we'll also be incorporating MIAC into this. Uh, MIAC is the, um, the um, aerosol optical depth retrieval algorithm um, at one kilometer resolution 
it's now operational and, and you can see the web link on the bottom where one can access the data a technical paper discussing the algorithm is um, this um, um, first web link here. Um, it's a product for aerosol optical depth, which is a column integral of aerosol mass. And it's um, based on MODIS, Terra, and Aqua top of the radi atmosphere radiances, inferring AOD from those measurements. And it is at one kilometer resolution. So three um, portions to this um, project at the Imperial Valley. First, to um, assess the MIAC AOD special patterns for high wind, high PM cases. I'll talk about that. Second, to assess particulate sources using IVAN data with dispersion modeling. Akula Venkatram will talk about that. And the contribution of IVAN monitors to a random forest PM 2.5 prediction model. Yang Lu will talk about that. We'll show a summary of the work here. Fuller slide sets of this work will be shown on the Tiger Team website here on the on below in the coming weeks. So le leading off with the high wind, high PM cases, the goal of this study is as such, windblown dust events are large contributors to Imperial Valley PM exposure, especially in the spring and fall in the northern part of the valley. Can the MIAC AOD product and IVAN sensors together be used to better determine the average spatial pattern associated with these events? Is there a mutual corroboration of the AOD and ground-based PM 2.5 patterns? And so the procedure for doing this will be to aggregate AOD fields from the MIAC aqua overpasses, which pass by at about 1.30 p.m. every day for strong west-southwest wind events associated with high p.m. from windblown dust and analyze together with the routine and IVAN ground monitoring and compare the fields. In this talk, we'll see a visual comparison. More statistical work is on slides that will appear on the site that um, if there's questions I can bring up, but for now we'll just look at the visual comparison. These are all draft results and work in progress. Okay? So this here is an image of the results of compositing AOD for 18 modus aqua overpasses during springtime in June 2000, March through June 2016 and 2017, the time period where we have contemporaneous IVAN monitoring, as well as this routine monitoring. So the AOD pattern is the color um, pattern um, underneath and the sensor measurements are over on top. You can see the scales on both. What's noticeable is that there is a clear correspondence in the AOD patterns with the ground measurements with the higher AOD corresponding with where the higher PM measurements are. This, these are for the west, the, this winds pattern is west strong out of the west southwest in these events. One can see a clear demarcation between the higher PM, um, AOD and PM to the northwest and the lower to the southeast. So this, there's a cooperation between the AOD and the PM 2.5 visually that's very clear from this. A um, couple of uh, things to note of the advantage of using the IVAN, you can see that there the AOD indicates a high um, PM um, area up to the northern part of the valley where the one monitor from the routine doesn't indicate that. When you add in the IVAN monitors, you can see a clear um, corroboration between um, the higher PM and the high AOD that doesn't show up when only using the routine monitors. Likewise, you can see that with the, a low value here in El Centro, one might be curious to see if that um, is that indicates a broader area of low AOD. And when you add in a low PM, I'm sorry, when you add in the sensors from the IVAN, you can see that that fills in and there's a better cooperation. Um, the other thing, this, this, this map shows um, a pattern. It does not indicate what the source of this PM, namely this could be blowing in off the desert or it could be grinding off the valley floor. Modeling can be used to do that and that's where Akula Venkatram will come in now and um, talk about how air dispersion modeling can be used to glean out sources of PM in these cases. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Frank. Uh, uh, can you put up my slide, first slide? Mm -hmm. uh, this is Akula Venkatram from uh, University of California at Riverside. I'm going to follow up on what Frank said uh, about uh, using dispersion models to interpret uh, measurements from low-cost sensors. Um, uh, can any, everyone hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, uh, go ahead and Sorry. expand it. Okay. So Frank has already talked to you about the low-cost uh, monitors. They represent a really good opportunity to 
come up with much fine scale, um, uh, much fine scale spatial patterns using dispersion models. So what I'm going to show today is how to use these PM 2.5 from Dylos monitors uh, and interpret that with dispersion models to come up with concentrations at any scale you want. Um, so, so the next slide, uh, next slide uh, shows, you, uh, shows you the uh, monitors that uh, Frank has already shown you. Uh, obviously, it doesn't look as pretty as what Frank showed you, but this is my rendering of what I thought it was. Uh, so here, what you see is the convention I'm going to use to discuss the sources so, uh, so the, the Western Desert is essentially represented by one line source, Salton Sea by another line source, and the East by several other line sources. So when I talk about these sources, I'm essentially talking about boundary sources that are essentially Western, Salton Sea, East, and then Mexico. And the sources, the agricultural sources, are essentially denoted as valley sources. So could you go to the next slide, uh, Frank? So this is a little more detail uh, where I've got essentially 11 line sources denoting different regions. So again, um, so I, I'm gonna focus on four monitors, Calipetria, Westmoreland, Brawley, and Calexico, just to illustrate the whole technique. In principle, we can actually predict concentrations anywhere we want, at any scale we want, and that's the whole point. If you want to use a dispersion model, once we've got all the sources, we can predict concentrations at scales ranging from tens of meters to hundreds of meters. So let me go to the next slide and show you the basic approach we use. We apply dispersion models. When I say dispersion models, it's dispersion models like say AirMod. I think a whole bunch of you are actually familiar with AirMod uh, and other um, state-of-the-art dispersion models that are used in a regulatory framework. So this essentially uses all the micrometrology and everything else that most dispersion models use. So here we treat the boundaries as line sources and the valley as an area source. Then we assign unit emissions from each of these sources. And then what we do is, we, since we have got a whole uh, bunch of monitors, something like 21 monitors is what we use in this exercise, we estimate emissions by fitting model estimates of concentrations to PM 2.5 observed at the monitors. So, uh, so here I show a typical result on the right corner, you see the, what I mean by fitting. You fit the concentrations uh, by using uh, essentially a least squares technique. And once you have, uh, by, by treating the emissions as unknowns, and then what you get is the result. Uh, the result basically is uh, basically the red bars that you see. It shows the different emission sources in that area. So here I've denoted five emission sources uh, valley sources uh, in tons per day. So the y-axis is in tons per day. Uh, it shows Mexico, East, Salton Sea, and the West Desert. Notice the, the valley essentially dominates the emissions. So most of the concentrations, the high concentrations that you're seeing in the uh, Imperial Valley actually come from local sources. Of course, Mexico makes a contribution and so does the West Desert. So if you go to the next slide, I can show you what happens to these emissions? As uh, Frank indicated in his previous slide, a lot of these emissions are associated with high winds. So here what we have done is we have filtered the data for low winds and high winds. So we have essentially fitted the model uh, using winds less than say six meters per second and then winds greater than six meters per second. And you are, here you see uh, emissions actually vary rather substantially depending on what the winds are. So if you notice on the left, it, this is for all the winds, uh, West Desert, Salton Sea, and the East. So these are different regions, uh, tons per day. So if you look at the look at the y-axis, you see uh, numbers like five tons per day, 14 tons per day. Now, if you look at the right-hand side, you see emissions that are at least five times higher. So the basic model here of the story is that the emissions vary substantially as a function of wind. So you can't really assume that the emissions are constant. As soon as the winds go up, you have higher concentrations resulting from wind-blown dust. Even the valley sources go up from, say, 12 tons per day to something like 50 tons per day. And the West Desert goes up from 4 tons a day to 20 tons a day. Uh, so the, here, here the major idea is that emissions cannot be uh, considered to be constant. And the next slide shows you contributions that you can get to different receptors 
Calixico is next to Mexico. Brawley, if you, uh, if you remember, is in the middle of the uh, Imperial Valley. Calipatria is actually in the east. And Westmoreland is near the desert. And as you expected, you see the contributions uh, next to Mexico being the highest in, at Calixico and Mexico emissions. And uh, these are actually concentrations. So what you see is the contributions to the monthly average concentrations in June. So I'm just illustrating for one month. You can do it for any month at any time scale as well as scatial scale. So what you find is next to, as expected, next to Mexico, you find that the concentrations uh, are uh, dominated from emissions from Mexico. And then when you go towards the center of the valley, you find that it is dominated by the valley, valley emissions themselves. And when you go to the west, uh, west Westmoreland, I just want to show, uh, 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 as you go to the east, you find Calipatria is, of course, dominated by local sources completely because it's towards the east. And when you go to west Westmoreland, both the desert as well as the valley dominate. So the main concept here is that once you've got a dispersion model that has been fitted to the data, you can learn a lot about the emissions as well as predict concentrations at any scale you want. So if you go, go to the next, uh, next one, you can see that you can actually, in addition to looking at contributions on a monthly, uh, monthly basis, you can also look at what happens to the contributions uh, depending on what the wind speeds are. Here I've illustrated for June 2017 uh, at what happens at high winds, uh, you find that the concentrations from Mexico now actually increase or of course dominate the concentrations at, uh, at uh, Calexico. In Brawley again, it's the valley. So the, the major thing you notice here is that local sources are a major source of high concentrations. And so it's not just external sources even though the desert does contribute. Uh, Mexico does contribute in the south, but most of the time the valley is actually making a major contribution, which basically means that agricultural sources, uh, agricultural sources that are disturbed by the wind are actually causing uh, the high concentration. So once you have this information, if you can go to the next slide, uh, you can actually uh, estimate uh, emissions from different sources. Of course, that's what we do initially. But the main concept here is that you can actually compute the concentrations at any receptor, at any scale you want, at the finest scale you want, once you've actually calibrated the model against concentrations. And of course, the next step, of course, is that you can actually, um, you can actually make sure that this is consistent with AOD data from satellites in the sense that it actually limits the emissions once we have got AOD data. I have not yet done this for Imperial Valley, but, um, uh, but we have actually done it for the Los Angeles area. We, have, we actually use AOD data to, uh, to make sure that the emissions that we were getting, or at least the concentrations we were getting, were not inconsistent with the AOD data. So that's all I have. And if you, have any, if you need any details, please feel to contra contact me or uh, uh, we'll we'll put up more details on the on the website. That's all I have, Frank. Thank you, Vinky. Okay, so and this moves on to Jan to quickly um, discuss his the effects of Ivan on random forest forest modeling. Jan, you there? Does Jan... Can okay, you hear me now? Yeah, okay, here you are. Okay. Oh, you're good. So uh, this is, uh, uh, like Frank said, we develop a, a random forest model in this domain uh, to see how we can integrate uh, a local, local sensor network into the uh, satellite model. Uh, first thing to, to note that there are very few satellite model development applications in the West Coast. Uh, because of it, its rugged terrain, uh, fewer uh, vegetation covered regions, and also uh, the lower quality of the satellite data. Uh, we selected Ivan uh, Imperial Valley as our study site because there is a, a local local sensor network, optical uh, measurements. And we also have a, uh, another modeling effort going on for the entire Southern California, uh, which will not be discussed here. So here, uh, like I said, the, uh, 
domain looks like the upper right figure. Uh, in this area, we only have six EPA uh, gold standard monitoring stations and 39 local optical sensors. Okay, our study period is a little bit over uh, a year. Okay, next. The reason that we chose random forest is not that it's always superior to other machine learning methods. Uh, we chose random forest because it allows us to uh, evaluate the importance of the, pr the various predictors and do some uh, model uh, optimization. This is what goes into the random forest model. We have a bunch of land use parameters, we have a uh, uh, gap field, satellite MIAC AOD. We have uh, some other pre-treated uh, convolutional layers. And very importantly, we included a PM10 to PM2.5 ratio. Uh, this has never been done before. In the East Coast, it's not necessary. Okay? In the West Coast, we suspect that the satellite data, um, although it's supposed to be most sensitive to PM2.5. Uh, and because of the abundance of coarse mode particles, uh, PM10 actually plays a role in here. So we, we, we designed a uh, interpolated PM10 to PM2.5 uh, ratio as a predictor. Uh, next slide, please. And OK, similar to the New York City study, we have three models in this case. We have the AQS only. Random forest model, you can see the sample size is very small, only about 1,600 uh, records. Okay? It has a uh, kind of an inferior cross validation R square uh, around 0 0.53. And because there are only six monitors, once we do a spatial cross validation, the model performance is very bad. Uh, the spatial CV R square is only 0 0.25. Okay? Uh, second, we have a Ivan only model. Ivan being the local uh, local sensor network. This one, the uh, sample size is five times or six times than the AQS. Okay, overall R square is much higher than the AQS only model. Um, and the last one is a combined AQS Ivan model. And in this case, you see the uh, sample size goes up slightly by maybe by a thousand uh, because we gridded everything to the one kilometer spatial resolution grid. Uh, the overall R square, uh, uh, CV R square dropped a little bit. Okay, the temporal CV R square remains the same. The spatial CV R square drops a tiny bit. So basically, because of the large uh, number of samples from the local, the, the local sensor network, the Ivan only uh, model is essentially the same as the AQS plus Ivan model. Okay. Um, so from this model performance table, we can see that the uh, AQS data set in this little bit like a remote neighborhood is not sufficient to train a high performance PM 2.5 uh, prediction model. Okay. You have to have something to supplement it especially on the spatial coverage. And then the combined model prediction accuracy is reduced a little bit. So the, uh, the third and the fourth row, even though the Ivan only model has a slightly higher cross validation R square, there's no guarantee that this is true because we're fitting the model to a noisier data set and assume that noisy data set is the truth, okay? So the slightly lower CVR square indicates that the two data sets, the Ivan and the AQS data set are not fully compatible. So we have to, you know, this is a very preliminary work. In the end, we have to figure out how to, how to sort of make the, the local sensor data compatible to the gold standard data. Next slide, please. This is the prediction. If you look at the AQS only model, it's spatial coverage so poor in the end, what we're looking at is the, the row network, okay? So the data is basically, the, the prediction surface is governed by the uh, land use parameters. If you look at the, the Ivan only model and the AQS plus Ivan model, the spatial patterns are very different from the AQS only model, okay? And the good thing about 
having still having AQS in the input data set is it reduces some of the uh, unnecessary noises in the uh, local sensor data. If you compare uh, figure B with figure C, you can see the lower left corner, the combined model has a cleaner background because there's there's pretty much nothing there. Um, so that that's the uh, sort of the preliminary finding for this study. Uh, that's all I have, Frank. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing now and we'll send it back to the Pat, okay? Thank you, thank you uh, all of you um, and, and all of the speakers for your uh, clear and excellent presentations. Um, several questions have been posted. Um, the last couple actually, uh, uh, I think uh, Yang would be a good person to answer the one about the RM, RMSE and also the PM10 to PM2.5 ratio. Yang, are you able to read those or shall I read them to you? If you can't see uh, Yes, I, I can read them. Um, so let, let me uh, first answer uh, Rebecca's question. Why is the PM10, PM2.5 ratio not needed in the East Coast? Because uh, it's much less of a presence in the East Coast. So the, uh, if you think about how the satellite retrieves that, that aerosol optical depth uh, parameter, uh, it's, re it's retrieved using uh, visible wavelengths, visible and near infrared wavelengths. At those wavelengths, the light, the smaller particles are much more capable of scattering or absorbing light. Okay, so uh, when you have a lot of that, basically the AOD is a good indicator and a good indicator of fine particle abundance in, in the atmosphere. PM10, on the other hand, they're bigger, but not necessarily more efficient light scatterers. Okay? Only when, they ha when there are many, they become a role. So basically, there is a discernible contribution of coarse particles to AOD. That's what we found in the West Coast studies. And it's very new. I'm not sure if this ratio is the best way to incorporate PM10 into the model. But it looks like we have to have it. Without this ratio, the model R squared dropped by 0.1. So it's, it's extremely important uh, to have it. Thanks, Jan. Um, uh, if, uh, if, you're, if, if that did not clarify your question, uh, then Rebecca, feel free to type an additional question. Um, I, I saw a question up a little bit uh, from Kai Chen about wondering about the contribution of um, for, for taking into account non-regulatory monitoring data, is spatial coverage more important than temporal coverage? I think my, I would say that probably, that the answer probably depends on the, the objectives of the study, whether the study objectives have to do with characterizing spatial patterns versus temporal patterns, um, which is kind of a, a cop out on the question. But um, I think the, from the information I've seen from what Yang has presented, in general, I would guess that having more spatial density will give you more useful R square than more temporal density. Uh, would you, uh, Yang, would you agree with that or would you want to address that from a different perspective? Um, I mean, I, I agree with what you said, Pat, that it, it really depends on the study objectives. Um, but for the, in the, um, in the, in the New York City study, we see that, uh, uh, the, the NICAST network improves both, I think, you know, both temporal and spatial. So basically the, the contribution comes from sample size, right? On the West Coast in Ivan, basically the, 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 the Ivan network overwhelms the AQS. So I don't know if it's just temporal or spatial, maybe both. There's a new question here. Um about uh, whether CMAC has been incorporated into some of these uh, fused you know, models that take into account F, you know, sensors, uh, regulatory monitors, and satellite data. I, I don't know if, uh, if this group is, has incorporated CMAC, but I know others have. Uh, right, yeah, we're, uh, we're thinking about it. So we're, we're working with EPA to access their long-term CMAC simulations at a uh, good enough spatial resolution to, to, to conduct such a study. Okay. 
Great, thank you. Thank you, Young. Um, are there any uh, other comments from the speakers that you'd like to uh, throw in before we conclude? I think uh, some of the other questions that were posed by participants have been addressed in text. Um, I will draw your attention specifically, I'm gonna share my screen again so that you have the website for the HACAS program and specifically for the so-called Tiger team that we've been really talking about today. So let me just post that up here. I'll leave, um, I'll leave you with that. Um, and and um, as I do that, I will, um, let me get that over here. Can you see that? Yeah. So uh, posted there uh, in blue is the is our uh, Tiger Team uh, website. So that's where you'll be able to find uh, the recording, the video and audio recording from this, as well as the slide decks. Um, thanks to the, all the speakers and to the participants. I really appreciate the time you took today and the efforts that were put in by the participants in the project. And uh, thank you very much. Take care. Thank you.